This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. Did you get that? All of the men. All, the entire town shows up. They called out to, uh, to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him. And he said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of our way, they replied. And they said, This fellow came here as an alien, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness. By the way, the word blindness also just reads darkness. So that they could not find the door. The two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here because we're going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against his people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry and get out of this place, because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are, who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives, don't look back, and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, No, my lords, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes, and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me, and I'll die. Look, here's a town near enough to run to. It's small. Let me flee to it. It's very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. He said to him, Very well, I'll grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of. But flee quickly, because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That's why the town was called Zoar, which means small. By the time Lot reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land. The Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back. She became a pillar of salt. Now let me ask you some questions. What if your life was ravaged by sin and you were so lost in that condition so lost in that condition that you had no idea how bad off you were what if that sinful condition was about to destroy you and the messenger of God came along and said you're worth something to God and he wants to rescue you from your sinful condition before you die would you listen? What would it mean to you if you suddenly discovered that God believes in you? Would it change your life? Did it? And if it did, how are you different today than when you were lost in your sin? All of us have some of Lot within us. We have some of his nature, some of his character. We behave a lot like him. We all do. And I want us to see something about Lot's life. Lot's life is a study in the contrast of God's will versus man's will. The contrast of God's ways and man's ways. When we first saw Lot earlier in our study in Genesis, he was a younger man, uh, Abraham's nephew. And his father had died and Abraham took him under his wing. And he goes with Abraham to the land that God led him to, and riding his Uncle Abraham's coattails, he becomes wealthy. And Abraham gives Lot the choice of the land to settle in. And Lot 
chose the prime land. And we see him begin to gravitate towards Sodom and Gomorrah, which was an evil and vile area. Now on the map, you can see over to the left, that is the area that Abraham took. And then uh, Lot took kind of the southern and area closer to uh, the Dead Sea, which was very fertile and a very rich land. And he set his tent. You can see kind of on the lower left hand there uh, where it says Lot's tent. That's where Lot settled. But eventually, he just sort of kind of migrated down around the lake and it ended up over in Sod the Sodom and Gomorrah area, right, right below where it says Moab there. And you'll see that just below Gomorrah is the little town of Zoar. Now some people have put the town of Zoar at the very tip of the Dead Sea, but it, uh, it makes a little more sense that it was right where we have it on the map there. And so that's where he ends up. And he's living in that area, and eventually he's kidnapped by a foreign king, and Abraham has to go rescue him. But instead of getting away from the evil that is surrounding and permeating Sodom and Gomorrah, he returns and he takes on some of the characteristics of that evil life. Even to the point, as we saw in this passage, of offering his daughters up as virgin sacrifices, even though they were engaged to be married. And that life, contrary to God's ways, is about to destroy him, and he doesn't even see it. He doesn't recognize it. What a horrible, horrible place that was. What a horrible condition to be in. What a horrible set of circumstances. But here's a newsflash. It was no worse then than it is today. In fact, look what the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, starting with verse 5. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people and pr but protected Noah, the preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what's going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, and remember I, I told you last Sunday, don't put too much emphasis on this word righteous. This just means that he was separated. He was Adam's. He was Adam's blood, and so he was he was separated, and he was somewhat of a good man, but he was he was nevertheless uh, he wasn't as evil as the rest of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lives of the lawless men. For that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds that he saw and heard. And he was probably the one, by the way, who actually cried out to God. Remember God said, I heard those, you know, the cries that come up about what an awful place this is. Well, according to the word, that probably was a lot. If this is so, verse 9 says, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of their sinful nature and despise authority. Wow. There's a picture of America. Bold and arrogant, these men are not afraid to slander celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not bring slanderous accusations against such beings in the presence of the Lord. But these men blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like brute beasts, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed, and like beasts, they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. Did you get that? Reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. Actual language there means cursed children. <laughs> that sounds pretty relevant to me. That sounds an awful lot like the conditions that we live in today. And one of the things that we discover about Lot in this story is that he was very much like Christians, many, many Christians today. We find uh, an awful lot of his nature and character in our lives. For example, we see that he was sensitive to the things of the Spirit. He got up and met those two angels when they
they came to the gate. You know, to compare it, what Lot did with what Abraham did, and it was identical. Now, some of that was cultural. You know, when somebody came to visit, they greeted them, and they invited them to the home, and they fed them, you know, and they protected them while they were, were in, their, their, in their home. It was, it was a cultural thing. But it was a little bit more than that, because he sensed, he sensed something different there. He knew that there was something special about them. He was somewhat sensitive to spiritual things. There are an awful lot of Christians today who are sensitive to some spiritual things, but not all spiritual things. And they go through this roller coaster ride in their spiritual walk. That didn't make sense. But they go in a spiritual roller coaster ride in their life. They have highs and they have lows. And sometimes life is very fast and sometimes it slows down and it's just out of control sometimes. And they just seem to reach these highs and it's wonderful. And then all of a sudden, moments later, they're in these incredible lows, incredible depression, spiritual depression. How does that happen? But it does. And Lot was like that, sensitive to some things of the Spirit, but not necessarily walking all the time with God. A lot of Christians like that today. He was defensive against some immorality. When they surrounded the house and wanted to bring the men out and, and, and have sex with them, he was insistent that that's not acceptable. He stood out there and defended them. He stood up against immorality. But not all immorality. In the very next breath, he offers his daughters. So there were some things that he was really indignant about. And he would stand up. I'm always amazed at the people who find little areas that they are just, they're, they're, I'm going to fight till death's end on this one area. It's some issue of immorality or impropriety, and they're going to stand on the hill. I'll give you a perfect example. Cruelty to animals. Now, the Bible, by the way, the Bible teaches that we are not to be cruel to animals. It is a violation of the Scripture to, to, be, to be cruel to animals. As a matter of fact, read the story of Balaam sometime, what he did with his donkey and see what happened there. And, and in fact, God gave Adam and Eve watch care over the animals. They were to be sensitive to the animals. The Bible teaches that we're not to be cruel to animals. And some people just get so indignant, so morally uh, perturbed over the indignities that happen to animals and the cruelty that happens to animals. But tell me if they have ever once wept over the sin of their nation. See, it's, it's easy to get caught up on some morality issues and get focused on those. I mean, let's face it, who isn't, who isn't against child abuse? And there are some people who just who fight, you know, for, for the rights for children, and they should. But at some point I have to ask, what about the sin of the nation? Have you wept over your own sin before God? <laughs>